morning. We are excited about what God is doing, not only in our lives, in this church, and in this community. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. For God is moving and He's doing things, and yes. things are changing yes. all around us. Now, you may not see that yet, but it is happening. It's happening in the realm of the Spirit. And uh, I am excited because I see some things that God is doing. I want to welcome everyone this morning to this house. Uh, if it's your first time here, make yourself to home. And the way we do things around here is when you're here the second time, you're no longer a visitor. That's right. <laughs> Amen. So uh, we treat you like a guest this morning, and after that, you're just family. Praise Amen. the Lord. Stand with me this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we honor you this morning. We honor the King of glory in this house. We honor the Lord of glory. The God who is high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. We honor you this morning. We bless the name of Jesus in this house. We magnify you, Lord. We glorify our God in this house. Oh, we just bless you, Jesus. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you Lord. We count it a privilege. We count it an honor to know you today. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of stepping into the glory of God. We thank you, Lord, for feeling the embrace of God upon us this morning. All across this house, we just embrace you, Lord. We embrace the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, he which has made all things. We embrace you, Lord, and we invite you, Lord, to have your way in our midst here today. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. Yes, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Now, Father, have your way in this service. In the name of Jesus. Let the glory of God be seen in this house. I pray today that the government of God would flow freely yes, from this house today. Yes, that the government of God would be established in this house and go out to this community in the name of Jesus. That every knee would bow and every tongue would confess yes, Lord. that Jesus Christ yes, Lord. is Lord. Yes, Lord. To the glory of God. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 16. Glory to God. I heard something in the Spirit this week. And because of what I heard, we're going the direction we're going. And some of you who were here last week will get a little bit of a repeat from last week. And I say a little bit because we didn't do last week justice. The young couple that was here last week, he asked me during the week two or three times, he said, are you going to talk about the blood this Sunday? And I said, I don't know yet. I'm waiting on God. And we're in a series called Reigning with Christ. But uh, I heard something in the Spirit, and I'm going to tell you what I heard. And what I heard in the Spirit, at first uh, I was like, God, what do you want me to do with this? But I heard a rumbling in the Spirit. Mm. I heard a uh, stirring in the spirit, and I heard these words. I'll be glad when he moves on from this topic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you, you've got to know, but when you start hearing things like this, it's important. I almost posted about it, but instead the Lord said, just hang on to it. Hang on to it. So this morning we are going to begin in Matthew chapter 16. And we are going to dive right in and we're going to have a good time in the Word this morning. Amen. Matthew 16, verse 17. And Jesus answered and he said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the revelation of Jesus, I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against you. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You can be seen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We've been talking about reigning with Christ, and uh, we've been on this particular verse a couple of weeks now, and we're just now getting into it. Amen. I want to talk to you again this morning about the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, I can tell you right now, I really would love to talk about the whole scripture that we just read. Because some of you came in here today as Simon Barjona, but if you'll allow the Spirit of God to give you a revelation, you'll leave here as Peter. Amen. Amen. I, I'm talking to somebody, and I really want to dive into that, but we've got to go somewhere this morning. What am I saying? Some of you came in here bound. You came in here perplexed. You came in here with a lot of weight on you, a lot of junk that you're carrying around, a lot of baggage. And the Lord says, I'm removing that from you today. I am setting you free, and I'm lifting you up to make you a new creature in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a word for somebody. I've been feeling it up through the whole service. That's a word for somebody. God is setting you free by the blood of Jesus. We're going to talk about the keys to the kingdom. And the important thing to recognize here is this scripture says keys, plural. There's not one key to the kingdom. There's many keys to the kingdom of heaven. Many. And so we talked last week about the significance of a key and what the purpose of a key. A key gives you entrance into something. That's the purpose of a key. The key is to unlock the kingdom of heaven. In other words, God has things for you that unless you get the key, you may not ever receive. Oh, God. <clears throat> Meaning, you can be born again, you can go to church, you can pay your tithes, you can be an active worker in the church, and never step into the things God has in store for you. Amen. Why? Because you didn't get a hold of the key to the kingdom. So we're going to talk some more about the keys to the kingdom. Amen. The first key that we started talking last week about is the blood of Jesus. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Yes. Hallelujah. I've looked back over the <laughs> service last Sunday and I asked God, I said, God, I just don't understand. We didn't get very far. <laughs> I don't feel like we did it justice. I felt like I was running. And uh, uh, the Lord said, you were running. There was something we had to do, and we ran to get there. And we did it last Sunday, for those who were here. And so this Sunday, we're going to do this justice. So just bear with me. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. That just came to somebody a few minutes ago. And strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, Hallelujah. which accused them before God day and night. And we talked a lot about the accuser of the brethren. And uh, we went into Job and we talked about the accuser, how Job was accused by the devil. Amen. So if you want, if you weren't here, get the CD so you can hear it. Amen. All right. They overcame, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Now, I've got to ask you a question. How did the accuser get cast down? By the blood of Jesus. It does not say that God cast him down. A lot of people are praying, God, I wish you'd get this monkey off my back. I wish you'd get this devil off of my life, off of my family, off of my situation, off of my job. I wish you'd get this demon, this spirit, off of my uh, finances. But the Bible says the accuser of the brethren was cast down, but it does not say it was by God. 
Now hear me, I didn't say God didn't do it. But God doesn't just do it. Amen. There's things that you're dealing with in life that you need to be have those things cast down. Amen. So how did the accuser of the brethren get cast down? Keep looking. They overcame him. Wait a minute. They overcame who? The accuser of the brethren was overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So how was the accuser cast down? He was cast down first by the blood, second by the word of their testimony, and third because they loved not their lives unto death. Amen. So we've got to talk a little bit more this morning about the blood. The blood is so important. You need to understand today that you are standing before God. I think we take things for granted. We know there's a God in heaven. We know that. Amen. 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 I don't think I've got to prove that. <laughs> we know, we believe there's a creator of everything that exists. We know there is a God over the universe. We know that he's out there somewhere, but we tend to forget that he's right here Amen. in our midst. And this morning, as you were worshiping God, as you were singing unto God, many were just singing words. You were following the lyrics on the screen, and you were just singing a song. And it sounded really good. I stopped there one moment during the worship, and I was just listening. And I said, God, it sounds so good. <coughs> And God said, yeah, but I'm not looking for good. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. He said, I'm not looking for good. I'm not looking for talent. I'm looking for those who will recognize that they're in my presence. Hallelujah. In his presence. Everything you do brings you before the presence of God. Your life, whether you know it or not, is lived before the presence of God. In other words, he sees everything. Yes. Yes. Everything. So everything I do, he already knows. I can't hide anything. There is nothing that I have done or will do that he has not or will not see. That's a scary thing. Amen. There's some things that I am not proud of. There's some things that I've done in my lifetime, in my past, that I wish I had never done, but I did it. That's right. And I can't hide it. If I try to hide it, he will expose it. Right. Amen. And there's things in your life that is the same way. God knows everything about you. Amen. Now the devil, on the other hand, has to search it out. <laughs> he has to search so he's called the accuser of the brethren. And he has to roam to and fro. And he's going about trying to find things to accuse you of. That's right. Amen. Amen. Right. And so this is a scripture that is telling us that the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Meaning his accusations that he's bringing before God about you are being cast to the ground. Because of the blood. Blood has a voice. Blood. I didn't say just the blood of Jesus. I said blood has a voice. And we looked at some scriptures last week about uh, the blood of, of uh, 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 Cain and Abel. We talked about Cain and Abel. We talked about the blood was still speaking. Amen. Because of the sin of, of murder. The blood was speaking. Exodus 34, 7 I'm just going to read the very last part of this scripture. and we, This is where we ended last week, so I'm making some good headway already. He said, he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generations. He visits the iniquity, the sin, the transgressions, the iniquity. The things that our fathers did. The things that our fathers' fathers did. All the way to the fourth generation. 
This is the word of God. Amen. We talked last week about in a court of law, when your parents die, who's responsible for the death? The children are. And the court of law, depending on what you have and how much you owe, may put a lien against your family estate. Amen. Now, I want you to think for a moment, whose family are you of? I have, a, I have earthly parents, but I have heavenly parents. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, if you're not born again yet today, don't leave here without being born again. Amen. Amen. Because you need God as your father. Amen. He's not your father till you accept his son, Jesus. Amen. Till you accept the blood of Jesus, which is what we're talking about. Amen. You're going to overcome the accuser. Of the brethren. You're going to be able to overcome the circumstances in your life. The problems in your life. Those things that you've been dealing with over and over and over. You're going to overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. 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 That's the word of God. So, if your parents die and the debt goes to the children. Likewise, unconfessed sins and iniquities in your bloodline. This is things that you personally did not commit. Hear me. Things that you did not do. The sins of your fathers. Those sins, those unconfessed sins and iniquities can be used by the accuser in the court of heaven against you. There are things that you do not even know about your family. I dare say there are things that you don't even know about your spouse. Ooh, they got quiet. <laughs> but the truth is the truth. My wife only knows what I share. And I only know what she shares. Amen. There may be something I've hid from her and there may be something she's hid from me. God knows all things. And the same thing is true with your father's 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 father. No matter how close you are to your ancestors, no matter how much you think you know, there may be some hidden sins that you never knew about. And there may be some things that you are experiencing in life because of the sins of your fathers. Now, the first thing I have to settle here is I'm not talking about salvation. I got to settle it. Because... If the day that you accepted Jesus as your Savior, you're born again. Amen. The blood of Jesus came in and he cleansed you of all Amen. your <coughs> unrighteousness. Amen. Everybody agree? Yes. If you don't, we need to talk at the church. <laughs> Amen. The day you were born again, you were cleansed of all of your sins. Therefore, when I accepted Jesus as my Savior, I was born again. I was washed, if you will, by the blood of Jesus. And the blood just cleansed me of all of the unrighteous acts that I have done. All these things of my past have been washed away in the blood. But the iniquities of your father were not. You came to him for yourself, not your father. Amen. When you gave your heart to the Lord, you came as yourself. Amen. You did not come as I represent my family. You came as yourself. Right. It's the only way you can get born again is as yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't come for your family and the whole family be born again because you got born again. It's an individual thing. Now your family can be a uh, uh, under a covering, under a protection, if you will, because you're under the blood, the Bible calls it sanctified. The unbeliever can be sanctified because you're sanctified. Amen. Amen. But it doesn't mean they're born again. They're not born again until they accept Jesus. Right. Some of our family in the past were not born again. I can 
can look back at my own lineage and I can see where a lot of my family was not born again. Amen. So when I gave my heart to the Lord, He cleansed me of my sins. He washed me in the blood. I was set free of my past. But since then, I have noticed things that have come up in my life. Things that were not a part of me. Things that were in my bloodline. Ooh. The enemy will use your sins of your fathers against you because the word says that God will visit the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and the fourth generation. Even though you did not sin, the enemy has the legal right, because the word says he has the right, to bring up the sins of your fathers against you. I didn't write the book. If I wrote it, I would have done it differently. I would have said that I was only uh, responsible for my sins. <laughs> Amen. That I would only reap the results of the sins that I committed. But do you know you've been reaping results of your family lineage for years and you didn't even know it? There are people today who uh, are dealing with uh, hereditary sickness. Meaning, not only have they got this sickness, but their parents had the sickness, and their parents' parents had the sickness, and their parents' parents had the sickness. It is passed down from generation to generation to generation. There are people right now on the face of the earth that blindness runs in their family. Amen. There are people I know right now personally that deafness runs in their family. It's been handed down. You say, but brother, I don't understand that. It's not, it doesn't matter if you understand it, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's called a generational curse. Amen. Now, some of these people that I'm talking about have given their heart to the Lord. But they still have the problem. Mm -hmm. Hear me. I'm here to help you this morning. Mm -hmm. I'm taking my time on purpose because we've got to get this. Some of these very people that are dealing with a generational curse, something that's been passed down from generation to generation. You know alcoholism can be a generational curse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. Sexual immorality, divorce can be a generational curse that has to be broken. I didn't say, and you need to hear me, I did not say everyone that's deaf is under a generational curse. I did not say that everyone that's blind is under a generational curse. I did not say that everyone that experienced divorce is under a generational curse. But I said it can be. And it's important that you find out if it is. Because if it is in your family, in your bloodline, then it will repeat to your children and to their children and to their children unless you break the curse. Yeah. This is very serious. You say, Brother Dan, I'm born again. I love God. It has nothing to do with generational curse. Nothing. A generational curse is something that your fathers did and they're, they've been cursed because of it. And it's been passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down. Do you know poverty can be a generational curse? We live in a society where a lot of people are living in poverty. Why? There's a generational curse that's being handed down from one generation to another generation to another generation. And it becomes the way of life. It becomes normal. And after a while, your family begins to accept it. Well, you know, heart disease is running our family. My dad, I wasn't sure I was going to talk about this, but I feel like I got to. My dad, a year before he passed away, started telling us, the family, you know, my brothers died at 65. They died at 65. 
heart problems. Hear me. You see, I'm talking to you about something I dealt with a long time ago. God revealed this to me when I was in my 20s. That's 30 some years ago. But my dad, for a year, he said, my brothers, they died at 65 with a heart problem. They died at 65. He said, I think I'm going to die at 65. My dad died at 65. God had already promised me he had five more years. Hear me. Five years before, he had a quadruple bypass. And I was at home when they called me and told me he was going in. And the Lord said, I give you 10 years for him. I heard the Lord as plain as day. I wasn't concerned about the surgery. I wasn't concerned about nothing. Why? Because I had a word from God. Amen. I knew that I knew that I knew. I heard the voice of God. He lived five years and then he died at 65 because out of his own mouth, he was confessing a generational curse. Yes. A generational curse. Well, it runs in my family. You know, diabetes is running in my family. You know, I have it so and so. My, you know, my mother has it, my father has it, whoever. I'm not talking about my family right now because they don't run in my family. Amen. But people say these things. Well, I've been dealing with it, but it's normal. We, we've had this in the family. It's not normal. It's not of God. And it's important that you realize there's some things going on in your lives that has been handed down as a lie from the devil, from the pit of hell, and you're experiencing things that you do not have to experience. It is time to break the curse. Yeah. It is time to get set free from the curse of, 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 of generations that's been handed down to you because of something that your ancestors allowed. It's a heavy message this morning. Turn Matthew chapter 11. Generational curse. Now, I know that there's a lot of thought going on right now. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest something to you. As you're looking over your family, I suggest that you ask God what is a generational curse in your family. You see, alcoholism was a generational curse in my family. I was an alcoholic at the age of 16. I'm telling you something. Alcoholism ran in my family. As a matter of fact, it ran in both sides of my family. On my daddy's side and on my mama's side. Alcoholism. But Jesus set me free. He set me free. He set me free. He set me free. And that generational curse has been broken off of my life. Do you know I have no desire for alcohol whatsoever? None. I can be around people that are drinking all day long. Doesn't bother me a bit. Not that I enjoy being around people that drink. <laughs> Amen. Some of them get a little out of hand. Yeah. Went to a party Friday night. My wife's Christmas party for her work. And they were drinking there. Amen. One of the board members come up and they had a bottle of something. I don't know. They said, we're about to open this. We'll share it with you. I don't want to know that. I'm not attracted. I have no desire to out for alcohol. Amen. I've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Woo. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 11. I just feel like sitting all of a sudden. Uh, he's talking about being free and you won't see it. That's right. Matthew 11 verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. From the days of John the Baptist until right now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Now, I don't know about you, but that scripture always bothered me. Because I have an understanding about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the sphere or the realm of God's dominion. 
The kingdom of heaven is the realm of the influence, if you will, of God. So if we're talking about the realm of God's influence, why is it suffering violence? Jesus. Think about it for a moment. We're talking about God Almighty, the creator of everything that exists. How is it that he, the king of glory, that his kingdom would suffer violence? Well, his kingdom is suffering violence because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You need to hear me. Every person upon the face of the earth, God has a plan and a purpose for them. Every person. You are not here as an accident. You are not here just because your mama and your daddy said, let's have a child. God knew you before you were born. He had a plan. He had a purpose for your life. You may not know that plan or purpose, but He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. And when you give your heart to Him, He wants to unfold, unlock, if you will, that plan and that purpose for your life so that you can walk into everything that God has in store for you. Therefore, some of the things that you're going through are not the plan of God. The devil may say he, that God's trying to teach you some things. That's a lie. Now God can use anything to teach us. He can take anything that has happened and he can teach us a lesson out of that. But he didn't orchestrate it. There are things that are going on in your life that God's getting blamed for that he didn't do. God didn't make you sick. God didn't make you poor. I'm going to go a step further. God didn't make you get divorced. God didn't make you poor. He didn't do it. He gets blamed for it. But God did not do it. The plans and the purpose that God has for you are being detained I'm going to go use another word. They're being derailed. Derailed because of the accusations that are being brought into the court of heaven. The things that God is wanting to give you are not getting to you because the accusations that are coming up in the court of heaven are derailing them. Anybody ever wonder why you're not farther along in God than you are? I'm talking about people that have been saved for a lot of these a lot of years. Have you ever wondered why? Some of it's because your, your, the plans and the purposes of God are being derailed for your life. Because of accusations. Not sins you're committing, but sins your father's committed that are coming up in the courts of heaven and they're stopping the blessings of God in your life. In the fabric of your DNA are hindrances. They are things that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation that can block the flow of the blessings of God in your life. It's in your DNA. Where'd you get your DNA? From your father and your mother. It's passed down from generation. Now the father is where you get the majority of. That's why he said fathers, fathers, <coughs> fathers. Amen. The majority of your DNA comes from your father. Ooh, I can get excited right there. Why? Because Jesus' father was the spirit of God. Right. You never thought about that, did you? <laughs> Amen. The majority of his DNA came from God. Amen. Even though there are things in your DNA and it's handed down and it's handed down and it's handed down and it's handed down it can be stopped these accusations that the devil is bringing up into the courts of heaven can be put down the bible says cast down by the blood Amen. of the lamb Amen. by the blood of the lamb in other words you are standing in heaven in a courtroom and God, the accuser of the brethren is throwing out accusations about your family. And he's bringing up stuff that you never thought about. 
Do you know right now you are, and I've got to be real careful real quick, you are a product of the teaching of your parents. And they were a product of the teachings of their parents. They were a product of the teaching of their parents. That's why there are certain things that you do right now that you don't even think about. There are things that you do that you think is just normal. That may not be right. As a matter of fact, it could be ungodly. I can get deep real quick. <laughs> I'm telling you, we could get off in some stuff real quick, but I don't want to derail us. I'm just trying to make a point. What I, and with this point, I'm going to suggest that you ask God, what are the things that you're believing, the things that were handed down from generation to generation that are not of God? If you ask it, he'll show you. Amen. Amen. There are some things right now that you are doing that are not of God. And when I say you, I mean every one of us. Every one of us. And with that, I'm going to make this statement, then I'm going to move on. With that, you're loving God with one breath and serving the devil with another. Jesus. Because of something that's been handed down in your bloodline from generation to generation to generation. Amen. It is important that you repent of the sins of your fathers. You must first repent of your sins, but then you must break the generational curse off of your family. Amen. So that it doesn't go any further. Amen. You can't undo what's happened with your fathers. They're gone. My dad's gone. My great-granddads are gone. But there was some sin. Alcoholism. Adultery, the list goes on and on. Amen. You've got to break that generational curse so that it doesn't continue in your bloodline. Not just for you. Not, hear me now, not just for you, but so your children's children do not carry out and get, reap the effects of your father's. It's called a curse. It's a curse for a reason. It's a curse for a reason. I don't want to take time right now, but uh, if you'll study about Jericho, for those who are taking notes, write it down. Study about Jericho. Joshua spoke a word over Jericho that whoever rebuilt Jericho, that their children, the eldest and the youngest, would die. I think that's exactly but something like that. That they would die. And when they went to rebuild Jerusalem, the eldest and the youngest died. But that curse continued. History shows that it continued for a season until the curse was broken. Until one day uh, the prophet came. It was either Elijah or Elisha. And they told them, the children, the children, they're all concerned about, why? Because the children were dying. I'm trying to remember what he took. I want to say salt, but I may be wrong. But he took something just normal and put it in the water. And the curse was broken because of what he did. Amen. You have to read it. But it was a curse. It was handed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. So do a study on Jericho, and you'll find it. The same holds true, and we talked just a little bit last week, about the fact that this generational curse over you and over your family can also be over a church and over a city and over a nation. It's very important that you start understanding there are things that are happening around you that are a part of a generational curse. Things that are happening uh, that may have been happening in this church, and we dealt with that last Sunday. I, I felt like we did a really good job of that. Yeah. I felt a release. I'm just being honest. I felt a release. We repented of the sins of the leaders in this church of the past. 
any sins that had been committed. Uh, even though I didn't have revelation of any, I felt led to do that. So we repented of that. We also repented of the sins of the city. This city that you and I are living in. Because a whole city can be held in bondage because of the sins of the leaders. A whole city. This is why it's important to have godly leadership. Amen. It's important to have men and women that are seeking God and are hungry for a move of God, not only in their lives, and not only in their church, but in their city. It's important. Men and women who will hear from God. An entire city can be experiencing corruption, poverty, lack of good jobs, sexual immorality, a high divorce rate, sickness, abortion, early death, religious bondage, demonic worship, and the fascination with the dark side depression, and suicide, all because of the sins of the fathers. Why? Because the fathers allowed it. They allowed it. They allowed it to go on. Do you know when you allow sin, you're a partaker of sin? Ooh. When you allow sin, you become a partaker of sin. It's really important that you understand that the leaders of this city allowed some things to be done and because they allowed it, it became sin. What I'm telling you today is in this nation, there are things that are happening from the top down because of the sins of our leaders. Amen. The sins. Generational sins that are being passed we, the church, who's the church? The blood-bought, born-again believers. We, the church, as the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Anybody believe you're an ambassador? Yes. According to the word of God, uh, when you were born again, you became a new creation, and in the very same breath, he said, he said you're an ambassador of God. You are. I didn't say it. He said it. You are an ambassador. We, the church, as an ambassador for God, for Jesus, must repent of the sins of our city, must repent of the sins of our nation, and we must reconcile our city and our nations and our families and our church and ourselves back to God. Yes. Amen. You said, Brother Dan, you just said we are supposed to reconcile. Because in the very same passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it is, verse 21, he said, He give unto us the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't say, I call specific ministers up for reconciliation. He's talking about those that are born again, that have become a new creation in God. He made you an ambassador of reconciliation. Reconciliation is to exchange sin for righteousness. Wait a minute. He made you an ambassador, a minister of reconciliation. Means that you carry reconciliation. You're a carrier. That's what an ambassador does. He carries a word of the person over him. Amen. So if I'm an ambassador for the president, I carry the word of the president or of the government wherever he sends me. So in this case, you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ carrying a word of reconciliation. You're carrying a word that is to bring an exchange from sin to righteousness. You are supposed to be restoring people to divine favor. Amen. Every born again believer. Not just the ministry. Reconciliation also means to make atonement. To make atonement. When Jesus died on the cross, he atoned for the sins of mankind. Amen. 
by atoning for the sins of mankind, he reconciled us. Anybody who will be a partaker of his blood is reconciled. You are taken from a sin nature to a righteous nature. You're taken from uh, the, the life of death and brought into life. How? Because the atonement reconciles you. Brings you back into the favor of God. Amen. It's all through the blood. It's all yeah. through the blood. Turn to Genesis chapter 18. Everybody still with me? Genesis 18. We're talking about a key to the kingdom right now. The blood of Jesus is the key. The blood of Jesus is a key to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> to unlock the things that are in heaven that you have not yet seen. For I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath bestowed upon them that love him. You haven't even seen what God has in store for you yet. Some of the things you're experiencing, they're gone. When you start seeing the way God sees. Genesis 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, I want to paint a picture for you real quick. The angels, a couple of angels and the Lord, the Bible calls him the Lord, came down, and he came to Abraham because of this statement. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I do? Why were the angels and the Lord coming down? In this particular passage of Scripture, they were headed somewhere. They were headed to Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. <laughs> Judgment had been passed. Sodom and Gomorrah was on trial. Oh, hear me. They were on trial. Why were they on trial? For the sins of the city. The city. There are sins of a city. And because of the sins of the city... God says, shall I hide this from Abraham? Well, why, I mean, you've got to think for a minute. Why did God say, shall I hide this from Abraham? You know, we think that God just loved Abraham, and so God just wanted to share everything. We, we've heard things like, uh, you know, we hear the scripture about that God will reveal things unto his prophets. That's a scripture. The secret things he'll reveal. But you know there's a reason he reveals things? There's always a reason. God has a reason for everything he does. He is not haphazard. He is not just, oh, well, I guess I'll go talk to Abraham about this. No. God had a reason that he said, can I hide this from Abraham? God could not hide this from Abraham. Ooh. Some of you are looking like, well, I never heard that before. God could not hide this from Abraham. Why? Because in Genesis 13, well, I'm not going to turn there because it, for time's sake, we'll run out of time really quick. In Genesis 13, Lot and Abraham were together. They were living together in the same area, and both of them were just being blessed. They were a bountiful, if you will. They had, uh, their, their families were growing, their cattle was growing. They were both very wealthy. Both of them. And it got to such a point that they were too large to live together. Genesis 13, read it when you get home. So they came together and they said, what can we do about this? So Abraham told Lot, he said, look all around and you pick an area that you and your family can go to and live at. That's what happened in Genesis 13. You pick, Lot, you decide where you want to take your family and your possessions so there'll be no contention among us. Oh, we need to hear that in the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. 
No contention among us. So you decide, where would you like to live? So Lot looks, and he sees the land where Sodom and Gomorrah was, and he saw the plains, and he said, it, it looks fruitful. It looks like a good land. It's a flourishing land. So Lot chose to go towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And he and his family and all of his possessions went to Sodom and Gomorrah area. Abraham gave it to him. Told him, you pick. And right after this, the Lord spoke to Abraham. And he said, look north, look south, look east, and look west. And as far as you can see, I give it to you. Wait a minute. He's still standing there. He's still in the same place. He hadn't moved yet. And the Lord said, look north, look south, look east, look west. And as far as you can see, I give it to you. He could see Sodom and Gomorrah. It was off in the distance. God gave Abraham Sodom and Gomorrah. Hear me now. God always has a man over an area. God always has a man, and I say man, it could be a woman, it could be whoever. God always has a person, a man, over an area. God is not haphazard. God has government. Yes. God has government. He has people in position strategically. Nothing is haphazard. God is doing things for a reason. So here Abraham was over Sodom and Gomorrah. So God comes down and he says, can I hide this from him? Sodom and Gomorrah, I gave to him. So he comes down and in verse 20 of Genesis 18, the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. What cry? The cry of the city. Do you know there's a cry of Yazoo City? There's a cry. It comes up before God. You need to hear me today. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. God has not been happy with the sin that's been happening in this city. God has not been happy with the devil worship that's been done in this city. God has not been happy with the... Uh, playfulness, if you will, with the underworld and the spirit world that has been taking place or the dark side in this city. He's not been happy with the uh, playing around with witchcraft. He's not been happy with the playing around with religious spirits. That's right. The cry has come up before God. He said, I will go down now. And I will see whether they have done altogether according to what? The cry of the city. There's a cry coming up before God. There is a cry of this city that has come up before God. He's heard the cry and he's come down to examine this city to see if it be so or not. But hear me. Verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abram stood before the Lord. Abraham stood before the Lord. And he drew near unto the Lord. And he said, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? <coughs> Hear me. This is a court setting. Sodom and Gomorrah was on trial and God Almighty had to bring Abraham before him. He had to bring the case before him because it belonged to him. So Abraham had a right to speak. I don't know about you, but the cry of Yazoo City has come up before the Lord and I ask you today, is there any Abrahams in the city? Is there any Abrahams in the city that are willing to stand before the Lord and to say, God, are you going to destroy this city because uh, destroy the righteous with the wicked? We know there's wickedness. We know this stuff has been done in this city. We already know all of that. But are you going to destroy Yazoo City because of the wickedness even with righteous people in the city? 
So Abraham said to the Lord, if there's 50 righteous, if there's 50, will you destroy it? Hear me. And the Lord said, no, I'll spare the city for 50. So Abraham said, well, well peer adventure, it's five short. If it's, if, if, if it's only five short, if it's 45 people, will you spare the city? And he said, I'll spare the city for 45. And Abraham said again, well, Lord, but what if there's 40? What is Abraham doing? He's pleading a case for Sodom and Gomorrah. He's in the courtroom of heaven, and he's pleading the case because it belonged to him. The city was his. He belonged over the city, and he's standing in the gap for the city. The sin was still there. Abraham did not say they have not sinned. Hear me. He never once said I'm not uh, that, that, that there's no sin there. He didn't say it. He knew there was sin there. But he said, Lord, if there's 40 in the city, will you spare it? <coughs> then he went to 30. <coughs> and he went to 20. And he went to 10. And Abraham stopped at 10. Hear me. Why did Abraham stop at 10? 10 is a number for governmental rule. It's a government thing. He stopped at 10 because that's where he was supposed to stop. If there was 10 righteous in the city, he had a right to spare that city. It's a governmental rule. He had a right that if there was 10 righteous people there, God would have the legal right to spare the city. Ten is also the number of the completion of God's divine order. Meaning that if there's only ten righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, that the whole city could be sanctified because of the ten righteous. In other words, they could be put under the blood. The death angel cannot cross the blood. Amen. I'm going to say it again. The death angel cannot cross the blood. Hallelujah. I've never once preached this message. Never. Never felt that to preach it. I've known it, I've practiced it in my own life, but I've never preached about it. Never thought about it anymore. I cleansed my bloodline a long time ago. And unless God brings something new up, I don't deal with it. But two weeks ago, God said this city's got to be cleansed. Amen. Why? Because God loves Yesu City. Yes, he, he loves Yesu City. Yes, there's been a whole lot of sin going on. There's been a whole lot of things done in the name of God that was not God. Amen. There's been a whole lot of things done that has made him unhappy. But he still loves this city. God wants to spare this city. I'm going to take you a step further. God loves the nation called the United States of America. Amen. He loves this nation. It is not the desire of God to destroy this nation. Amen. Never has been. I don't care who stands up and tells you judgment's coming, but I understand judgment. There is a, a, a repercussion for the things that you do. If you sow, you reap. Right. But there are those today that are preaching the destruction of the United States of America. There are those today that will tell you that this country will not be here in a few years. And I stand before you today to tell you that God has men and women in place that are pleading the blood over yeah. this nation. Yeah. And I don't know where you stand on that issue. That's between you and God. But I tell you today as an ambassador of Jesus Christ that you have the right to plead the blood Amen. over your city. Yeah. You have the right to plead the blood over your family. You have the right to plead the blood over your church. And you have the right to plead the blood over this nation. The devil does not want you to understand 
the power of the blood. He does not want you to understand that yes, even though you're under the blood, God has given you something to do and that is to stand in the gap for your loved ones. That is to stand in the gap for your church. That is to stand in the gap for your community. That is to stand in the gap for your city. That is to stand in the gap for your nation. That is to stand in the gap for your leaders. You are called to do it. Now hear me today. I want to say it's Ezekiel, but I may be wrong. It's been a while since I read Ezekiel. But the Lord talked about the blood being upon his hands. And what he was saying is if you don't tell them what I tell you to tell them, the blood's on your hands. If you don't tell them what I tell you to tell them, the blood is on your hands. But hear me. If you don't stand in the gap and you're called to stand in the gap, the blood is still on your hands. You are called as an ambassador of Jesus Christ to stand in the gap as a minister of reconciliation to bring people back to God, to bring your family back to God, to bring your community, your city, and this nation back to God. Hallelujah. That's why he said pray for those that are over you. Lord. You're supposed to be praying for them. Amen. You're supposed to pray for me as your pastor. You're supposed to pray Amen. for me. Amen. I don't care how anointed I am. You're supposed to pray that I do what God wants me to do. That I live a righteous life, a holy life before God. And that I hear the voice of God so that I declare unto you the word of God. And that I don't uh, water it down. That I don't uh, try to butter it up so you feel good about it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're supposed to pray for your pastors. You're supposed to be praying for your governmental leaders in this city. Amen. Amen. That's why when we did the Walk of Faith in March, we went to all the different governmental spots. And we read scripture and we prayed. We read scripture and we prayed. We read scripture and we prayed. That was orchestrated by the Spirit of God. It was important that we let the devil know in this city, this city is taken back for God. Yes. Amen. Amen. And a representative of the body of Christ came out that day and did this. Yes. And what we did is nothing more than I'm talking about right now. We were there to break the curse off this city. Amen. Break the curse off this city. Yeah. You must break the curse off your life. Yes, thank you. you do. You've got to stop the accusations of the devil. And the only way to do it is put your life under the blood. In other words, put yourself under the microscope for a moment and let God show you what you need to see. Oh, it's a scary thing. When you actually see yourself as you really are, every one of us have some hidden closets. Every one of us. We have some areas that we have closed off to the public that we don't let anybody see and we try to forget about. But God's never forgot. And you need to deal with those areas this morning. And after you've dealt with your own sins, then you can deal with the sins of your family. Then you can plead the blood over your family. And you can say, Lord, forgive my family for all of this that we've done. Then you can pray for your city. You can stand as an ambassador and say, this city will no longer be known as a city of witchcraft. It'll no longer be a dark city. You know I've seen the darkness on this city for over 20 years. Over 20 years. And it was, I saw it every year until March when God showed me the glory. Hallelujah. Penetrating the darkness. And now when I enter the city, I see the glory of God. I see the presence of God. Why? Because God has shown His glory. It is penetrating the darkness. And there are people in this city that are standing up for God, for righteousness, and they are getting the generational curse broken off of this city. Yeah. Last week, 
It was strategic, and I, I, I felt it so strong we had to do it. And we prayed over this church. And I stood before you as the pastor of this church, and I asked God to forgive me of the sins that have been done in the name of God through leadership. And I know that I know that I know we got the papers from heaven. Hallelujah. We've been released. We've been released. Ooh, I can shout. We also prayed over this city. Some of you didn't understand, told me what we were doing. But we prayed over this city, asking God to forgive us of the sins of our leaders of the past. But there's one thing we did not do. We didn't pray for our nation, and we didn't pray for you. Only you can break the curse off of your life. I can't break it. And I don't know what's going on in your family unless God shows me. But there are things that have been handed down from generation to generation. And it's time for it to stop. So if there's something in your life today that needs to be broken, God already knows it. Don't try to hide it. God already knows it. But if there's something that you know that stands out this morning, I'm going to ask you to step forward and come up this morning and we're going to, I'm going to pray with you, but it's, it's really you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right. We're going to pray for our nation. Do not pray this morning out of what you've seen. You need to hear me. Do not pray for this nation out of what you've seen on the news. Do not pray for this nation out of what you've heard your favorite preacher say. If you're going to stand in the gap, you got to hear from heaven. you got to hear what God says about this nation. If I look at this nation through the eyes of man, I see nothing but wickedness. But God doesn't see just wickedness. He sees the blood. He sees a nation that has sent missionaries all over the world. He sees a nation that was truly created by the founding fathers as a nation under God. It's been distorted. It's been perplexed. It's been uh, uh, twisted all around. But this nation was founded under God. Men and women that loved God came and started this nation so that they could worship God freely. So today, I want you as an ambassador of Jesus to pray for this nation. Truly pray for this nation that the sins of this nation would be covered by the blood. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, as a representative of Jesus Christ, I stand before the nation of the United States of America. And I stand, Father, as an ambassador of Jesus to reconcile this nation back to God. And right now, Father, I recognize the sins that have been created and done in the nation of the United States. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive us of the sins of our leaders. Forgive us for the sins even of the religious leaders in this nation that have set back and allowed sin to run rampant. Father, forgive us for going to bed with Baal. Forgive us, Lord, for going to bed with money and religion and all of these things, politics. Forgive us, Lord, for going to bed with these things. Father, today, I ask that you cleanse this nation. Cleanse us, Lord, with the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us, Lord. Father, I ask today, that you recognize our heart, that you recognize the desire of your people, and Father, that you divorce us from the sins of the past, that you divorce us, that you cut us free from the sins of this nation. 
that righteousness may reign upon the United States of America. That the glory of God may come again to this nation. That yes, abortion Lord. would cease yes. in this nation. Jesus. And that Jesus Christ would rule. That you would set upon the government of this nation once again with godly representatives. Yes. That you would raise up men and women that fear God, that love God, and that want to do the will of God. That you would raise our people to lead this nation that would bring us back as a nation yes, God. unto oh, God Almighty. Jesus. I thank you for it right now, Father. Yes, I thank you for the blood. I thank you for the blood. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. And I thank you that we are cleansed. We are cleansed. We are cleansed. We are cleansed. Yes, Lord God. Thank you. And I thank you, Lord, that even now that this nation is being changed. Yes. That you are raising up godly leadership. Yes. That you are raising up men and women that will not go after money. Yes. They will not go after power. Yes. They will not go after fame or fortune. Yes, they will go after you. They will go yes, after what Lord thus saith God. God. Hallelujah. They will go after the things that please you, Lord. Yes, Lord. I thank you for those thank people. You, Lord. I thank you for a godly president. Yes, Lord. To lead this nation. <laughs> A man or a woman that will not take that position lightly. Yes. They will not go in with motives that are their own, but Jesus. they will come into that position yes, and Lord. know that only God Almighty can show yes, them what Lord. to do. Yes, Lord. And I thank you. Thank you, Lord. That the repercussions of the sins of our fathers over this nation yes. is broken from this day forward. I thank you, Father, thank you, Lord. that joblessness is broken in the name of Jesus. I speak new jobs in this nation in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak new industries to come to the United States of America. Yes, Lord. That prosperity will once again return to this nation. Yes, Lord. Oh, I thank you for it right now, Father. Lord, I speak to this city again. Here you go. I speak to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I claim them for God. Yes. I claim them as a representative, an ambassador for Jesus. I claim this territory for Jesus. And I call now yes, to the north. And I say, come. I call to the south and I say, come. I call to the east and I say, come. I call to the west and I say, come. All that are in bondage. Yes, Lord. I speak unto this area liberty. I speak freedom. I speak health. I speak the glory of God to come to this area. Yes, Lord. And I call people to salvation in Yazoo City. Yes, Lord. And in the nation of the United States of America. Yes, Lord. I thank you for the right Lord. Now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.